Bertrand de Born is one of the more interesting French troubadour poets of the 12th century. As a nobleman and as a, uh, a, uh, as a poet, he, uh, he reached into an area of experience in life that is often uh, a little overlooked. Uh, by poetry or sensible poetry, let's say, uh, it certainly found some. Uh, it has certainly found some uh, admirers in the epic realm. But in terms of songs of the troubadours, uh, w which tended to gravitate more towards subjects of love, he instead chose his subject, his great subject, as war. And in praise of war is his great. Uh, one of well, it is his great surviving work. It's the one that most people know today, and in it he celebrates the uh, the martial qualities and values that uh, the aristocracy of the knightly realm of the Middle Ages would uh, would know very well, and the codes by which they lived, and he uses this opportunity to speak about war, but speak about war in a particularly medieval sensibility, in a particular way as a, as a mechanism for experiencing something divine, something greater than the ordinary. Uh, make of it what you will. Um, he begins it on a note that is naturally, uh, naturally religious. I love the joyful time of Easter that makes the leaves and flowers come forth, and it pleases me to hear the mirth of the birds who make their song resound in the woods, and it pleases me to see the meadows, tents, and pavilions planted, and I feel a and I feel great joy when I see ranged along the field knights and horses armed for war interesting he sees uh he first he, he he consecrates it in uh this time of easter you can pick any time in the calendar easter easter is a time of rebirth it is a time of uh, of life flourishing uh, it's springtime uh it is also uh the time in the medieval way of looking at things and the seasonal uh calendar let's say when soldiers go back to war. Uh, the winter is usually a time that they sit at home and get drunk for three months, but when everything thaws and it becomes pleasant out again, they hit the fields and go fight. Uh, and also notice the, the, the juxtaposition of he turns very quickly from the images of leaves and flowers and then that metamorphosizes into uh, tents and pavilions, knights and horses. So this hillside, this vista that he's imagining is suddenly uh, dressed up in a much more uh, martial garment than mere nature. And it pleases me when the skirmishes and, uh, make the people and their baggage run away. And it pleases me when I see behind them coming a great mass of armed men together. And I have pleasure in my heart when I see strong castles besieged, the broken ramparts caving in, and I see the host on the water's edge closed in all around by ditches with palisades, strong stakes close together. The, this great inspiration, the thrill of the battle coming. This uh, everything is marshalling together, and he's getting in on the excitement. And he's very, very uh, intrigued by this and inspired by this. Inspired, of course, is a religious notion of the idea of you are imbued with the breath of God. Inspired, the breath of God. So you are becoming infused with divinity at this moment and it pleases me when the skirmishes make the people in the baggage run away and it pleases me when i see behind them coming notice again and set it in the first stanza the focus on it pleases me it brings joy to me it's an experience of joy in my heart now that's a focus of the humanity 
of this character because it is a focus on him and his particular emotions. But it is a, uh, a, a joy that comes inspired by this vision. It pleases me. It brings me joy. And I am well pleased by a lord when he is first in the attack, armed upon his horse, unafraid. So he makes his men take heart by his own brave lordliness. And when a mix, and when the armies mix in battle, each man should be poised to follow him, smiling. For no man is worth a thing till he is given and gotten blow on blow. No man is worth a thing until he has proved himself in battle. Uh, interesting construction there. It's a sense of the ability to summit the ordinary, to come upon a scene and take your place there through pure aggression, through animal instincts, but to rise above the ordinary. It's a proving ground. Maces and swords and painted helms, the useless shields cut through, we shall see as the fighting starts, and many vassals together striking and wandering wildly, the unreined horses of the wounded and dead, and once entered into battle, let every man, proud of his birth, think only of breaking arms and heads, for a man is worth more dead than alive and beaten. Think only of breaking arms and heads. Uh, who was it? I think Teddy Roosevelt called this the uh, the, uh, the the moment of, of your crowded hour or something like that, uh, when it is just a release of your animal instincts, your pure bloodlust. Uh, a man worth uh, a, a man is worth more dead than alive and beaten, as if the only thing more pathetic than to be dead is to be, yeah, he got killed in battle. Hmm, questionable. I tell you there is not so much savor in eating or drinking and sleeping as when I hear them scream, they are here, let's get them on both sides. And I hear riderless horses in the shadows neighing and I hear them scream, help help and I see them fall among the ditches, little men and great men on the grass, and I see fixed on the flanks of the corpses stumps of lances with silken streamers. Note the imagistic quality here where it's painted in very sharp details. Not a lot of vague stuff, there is not a lot of abstraction here, it's just quick clean images and sensory images. Uh, he hears the screaming, specific words, there they are, let's get them, on both sides. He doesn't even really care, like, you know, about the hunt. He, he's not taking sides, it's just about the thrill of the engagement. And I hear riderless horses in the shadows neighing, which is a kind of nightmare scene of chaos, unleashed upon the earth. Uh, and I hear them scream, help, help. And I see them fall among the ditches, little men and great men on the grass. And I see fixed in the flanks of the corpses, stumps of last lances with silken streamers. Uh, again, images, hard concrete images, sensory in input. He is valuing what is uh, pure human animal instinct hearing and seeing. Uh, he is reducing the human being at this point to a kind of animal instinct, or perhaps he is raising human nature to a kind of animal instinct, because right now he is just a sensory being, seeing and hearing. But in that, he finds clarity. And also that kind of visceral sensation, again, that inspires, that raises the ordinary, or raises above the ordinary, let's say. Barons, pawn your castles and your villages and your cities before you stop making war on one another. Papioles, gladly go fast to my lord, yes and no, and tell him he has lived in peace too long. So here it's the clarion call at the end, the call to wall, saying, you know, uh, all of you fat cats back uh, sitting back enjoying life, uh, drinking and lazing around, you're not experiencing 
the beauty of this moment. You're not experiencing the passion. You have no honor. You have no value. Sell it all. Throw aside all worldly goods. Sell your castles. Sell your villages and your cities. Just who cares? Those are worldly concerns. What this poet, what Bertrand de Born, this poem is saying is that it's all nothing in comparison to the thrill, the inspiration of battle of warfare, of feeling that animal lust that is somehow more pure than complicated society and civilization. Now this is coming from a court poet, and courts by nature are diplomatic realms and political realms where you can sense that when you're caught up, especially after a long winter, this is Easter supposedly here, that they are tired of talking and negotiating and doing politics. Bertrand de Born is here released from that realm and wants to go out and stake a new claim on what really matters in life. And that is the passion, the bloodlust, the invigoration of pure, unadulterated emotion. But in that, he sees an ideal. In that, he sees something pure. He sees a transport to another realm because all of the worldly concerns of castles, villages, and cities, all of those mundane, petty things fall away when he is talking about something inspiring, when he is talking about an experience of something ideal, something divine something platonic, if you will, something that is greater than the ordinary.